just take a moment right now in any way you feel like expressing to God and thank God for supernatural victory in all areas of your life. Right now, just thank him the way you would for supernatural victory in every single area of your life. Now, saints of God, should the Lord tarry, I have a message of great hope, a message of a great future for those of us that live in America. So get everybody you can back to the house of God tomorrow night. We need hope in this country. We need a vision from God that gives us hope for this country. So you don't want to miss tomorrow night. Saints of God, how many are thankful that God promised you supernatural victory. But in order to win that victory. You've got to be willing to fight. You've got to be willing as an ex-boxer. You can't win the fight unless you're willing to step in the ring. And friend, I want to tell you right now, before you step in the ring, you need to remember this one thing. You're not fighting alone. This is a tag team match and you have a tag team partner and his name is Jesus Christ and he has a perfect record. He is completely undefeated, undisputed champion of love. He's never lost. He knows no equal. So when you step in that ring to start that fight, remember you're not alone. In 1 Corinthians 6, verse 17, this is a scripture that means a tremendous amount to Pam and I, and I sure to you also. He that is joined unto the Lord. These are not just mere words. This is the word of God. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will never pass away. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Now we're bone of his bone and we're flesh of his flesh. He is the head. We are the body. But you can't get closer than anybody, to anyone than being one spirit with that individual. So you, because you are a Christian and have that privilege, you are one spirit with Jesus Christ. That's why it's so important <laughs> that I crucify my flesh so that that one spirit with Jesus Christ can rise up within me and I act like Jesus and I think like Jesus and I do the things Jesus do because I'm already, according to the word of God, one spirit with him. And it's just a matter of getting the flesh out of the way. That's why I fast. That's why I do fasting because it gets my flesh out of the way. Crucify your flesh. So saints of God, when you step in that ring, when you walk in to do warfare tonight for yourself, for your family, for your country, for your loved ones, Remember when you step in there that you're already one spirit with your tag team partner. Somebody shout hallelujah. But tonight I want to talk to you a little bit if you haven't figured it out on the subject matter of spiritual warfare. Aren't you glad the word of God says tonight, everybody wave at me, that you are more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus that loves you. Aren't you glad that the battle's not yours, but the battle is is the Lord's. That pretty much to me guarantees victory. If I'm one spirit with the Lord, if the battle's not mine but the Lord and he never loses, if he says I'm more than a conqueror, then I'm more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus that loves me. No matter what I think of myself, I am more than a conqueror because Jesus loves me. So that's a wonderful given to know that if you do it biblically, you can't lose. But at the same time, and it's not an oxymoron, but it might seem like it. They're saying, God, it says that you're already, before the fight begins, more than a conqueror. Amen. That the battle's not yours, but it's the Lord's. But that same God, if I remember correctly, Brother Steve says, put on the whole armor of God. He says, put on the whole armor of God. Submit your brain to me and you got the helmet of salvation. Submit your heart to me. You have the breastplate of righteousness. Walk in my word and you'll walk in the gospel of peace. And I could go on and on and on. But it seems strange to me that at the battle, if I was not to participate in the battle at all on my end, why would God give me armor? Would I, why, would he get, why would I get all dressed up with nowhere to go? Then that same God says that the weapons of your warfare the weapons of my warfare, they are not carnal. 
You will never defeat demonic forces through physical means. God may employ your flesh through prayer, praise, and worship, but make no mistake about it, the victory will come through the spirit. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. So it would imply to me if God suited me up with armor and I had to choose to put on each piece on it of it, it's not a jumpsuit of God's armor. It's, it's individual pieces. And if he gave me weapons, then it would appear to me that once in a while, I'm going to need that armor and I'm going to need those weapons. So if we have to learn how to fight spiritual warfare, I don't know about you, but I want to learn from somebody that knows more about it than I do. Now, I wasn't a smart boxer, but I was smart. I live with my face, y'all. But I was smart enough to have a good cut man in my corner, to have a good manager to train me. And because of that, I was 114 and, and, and three. But saints of God, what I'm trying to say, most of those were amateur fights, golden gloves, but still that's, that, that's pretty good. And it's because I listened to my ring man. Even if he told me something that didn't make sense to my flesh, I did it because I knew he knew something about my opponent that I, he saw because I'm in the middle of the action. He's seeing things I'm not seeing. He's telling me, count to three and launch that right hand no matter where you see his hands at. And every single time I did it, it would land square in his jaw. So you, you, it's good to know how to fight spiritual warfare. Now, when it comes to biblical spirit, to spiritual warfare, there is no greater fighter in the entire New Testament than the brother Paul. He knew how to fight spiritual warfare and be victorious. So in 2 Timothy, I got to set the background here. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, this is such a victorious place for him to be. Now, most of you, everybody wave at me. Say, holy, holy, holy. 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 Most of you will never find yourself in this position. Somebody say, thank you, Lord. But the apostle Paul is on death row. He, he's on death row in Rome and he knows he's going to die. He was in the same Roman prison or one like it in Rome a couple years earlier. And he says, you know, I just got done talking to God and I'm torn between two things. I've been talking to God. In other words, God gave him input in his, in, in his future and his destiny. And he said, for me to die, it's far better to me because that means I get to be with the Lord. For me to live is far better to you so I can teach you what the Lord's taught me. And I don't know what to do. <clears throat> well, we know that he lives. And during that imprisonment and other imprisonments, as your pastors share with you, he wrote most of the New Testament. So he knew when he wrote others then that he had talked it over with the Lord and he chose to live for the good of the kingdom of God. Now that sounds strange to us, but he, ch and he chose to live for the kingdom of God's sake. But now two years later, he's 66 years old and he knows he's going to die. He knows he's at the end of his road. And I love this passage of scripture. Everybody wave at me. How, is there anybody, nobody looks forward to dying. I mean, if you're looking forward to dying, uh, my son's a licensed family counselor. I can recommend, and what I'm saying, most people, unless you get like really sick or elderly, are not looking forward to dying. But we do know it's appointed on the man to die than the judgment. Every human being alive that the Lord tarries is going to die. Now, you don't usually hear this talked about during revival, but it is a reality of life that we all must deal with. And this passage of scripture, Brother Steve, blesses me so much because of Paul's understanding of the reality of death and the right way to approach it when you know your time has come. Now, saints, everybody wave at me. Please understand this. I have sat at the casket of my mother, my father, siblings, and wept like a baby. And I didn't weep like mom and dad were not in heaven. I wept kind of selfish that for a while there was going to be this separation. They're alive in heaven. I'm alive here. I'm not making light of your pain or even in any way diminishing the loss you feel. But we as Christians know 
that when a Christian's life ends here, it doesn't really end. It just begins. It ends in the temporal and that Christian insert, insert into the eternal where there's joy unspeakable and full of glory. They're still alive. The moment they breathe their last breath, Steve, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. They stepped out of temporal and they stepped into eternal life where they will forever be with the Lord. There's no defeat in death not for the child of God. And the apostle Paul in these verses makes it very clear that death is as much a part of living as living is. Nobody's looking forward to it, but as a child of God, we don't dread it like the lost person does, but because of what Jesus did in our lives, we enter into eternal life. Oh, saints of God, joy unspeakable and full of glory. So the Apostle Paul has a real good grip on reality here. He, now, this is his, Timothy is his spiritual son. He, he, then he, if he had biological children, they're not mentioned in the Bible. But he, Tim, Timothy is a spiritual son, and he loved him, just like a parent would love their biological child. When God connects you some, with someone spiritually, and that person becomes your spiritual father or your spiritual son. That, that's eternal. And that is a close union beyond biological birth. I'm closer to you than my biological brothers and sisters because we've got more in common than I have with them. Come on, somebody. So Paul, this is the last thing that he's going to get to say to his spiritual son before his head gets cut off. I would think he weighed his words carefully. How many dads are in the house here? Let me see your hands. If you knew you were going to die, perhaps within minutes, you can see your gallows from your cell and you had one chance to write a note to one of your children or all your children. Would you not weigh those words carefully? Would you not tell them you need to serve God? Houses don't matter. Money don't matter. But you need to be right with God. Heaven's what matters. So this is Paul's fair, farewell address to his son, a personal epistle. And notice how he writes it. He knows he's going to die. Timothy knows he's going to die. Everybody knows he's going to die. And this doesn't seem how one would start a letter like this. I charge thee. I command you. He could use no stronger term than the word, I charge you. Instead of being all mushy and stuff, which I'm sure he was in a way, he says, I'm telling you, I'm not asking you, I'm giving you the command to do this. If you really love me as your spiritual father, you'll do this. See, Timothy's having a little problem. He's going through a crisis. The Rome is persecuting the church so badly that people, Christians, are being crucified by the hundreds every single week. And because of this, Timothy was over the first mega church of the first century that Paul appointed him to. And so he's writing Timothy because now there's a mass exodus because of the persecution that had come upon the church. Plus, Timothy is looking at his spiritual father and a slammer and human nature as it is is saying, hey, I saw God use Paul. I saw how God would, uh, would manifest through Paul. And if this could happen to Paul, then this could happen to me. And there's no telling with me being the pastor of the largest church in the known world at the time. If they get their hands on me, the kind of death I'm going to die. So this is a young man that is going through a lot. He's seen hundreds of people he depended on leave him for no reason other than the persecution. So Paul finds it necessary to write it like this. I charge thee, therefore, before God. There's a moment coming soon, Timothy. I'm not going to be physically in your life anymore, but God will always be in your life. I charge thee, therefore, before God. And then he follows it up. And the Lord Jesus Christ, I command you to do this before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and in and his kingdom. 
In other words, Timothy, if you don't do what I'm about to tell you, God is going to judge you. Now understand, as a Christian, you will not ever be judged for your sins because they've been cast in the sea of forgiveness never to be bought up again. But when you stand before God someday, you will be judged according to your works and be rewarded according to your works, according to Revelation 22 and 12. So saints of God, that's what he's talking about. You're going to be judged according to your works and the rewards you're going to receive for eternity in large part will be determined by what you did for God. And all we can do is what God assigns us to. Well done, you good and faithful servant who shall judge the quick or alive and the dead is appearing in the towels. We know there'll be people alive on earth when the rapture takes place and his kingdom. Notice verse number two. Say it's hoiky joiky. What we, what's he charging them to do? Preach the word. There's a lot of places today where people can go and hear any gospel they want. No matter what lifestyle someone chooses, if they chop around a while, they'll find somebody that will preach in a way to condone how they're living. That's just a fact. I mean, I've seen more weird stuff in the last 10 years than I ever dreamed could possibly happen in the kingdom of God in my lifetime. So you can find a church that will approve of anything but it doesn't mean God approves of it. And it doesn't mean God's in that church. And it doesn't mean it's a church. That's, it doesn't mean it's a part of the body of Christ. Someone shout hallelujah. He, he, in other words, Timothy, I'm in the slammer and I'm fixing to die for preaching the word. And my command to you, and if you don't do it, God's going to judge you. Do the same thing I did that got me arrested and put on death row. Now, how important is preaching the word? That's pretty important, Sister Owens, ain't it? Preach the word. Be instant in season and out of season. That's for all of us that may not be called to preach the gospel. You may not be called to a full-time pulpit ministry, but we're all called to preach. Our lifestyle preaches. How we treat others preach. Our honesty and integrity in business, it preaches. So we're all called to preach and always be ready to be a witness because you got to be instant in and out of season because you never know when God's going to give you a chance to be a witness. And saints of God, let me tell you something. I've helped train student pastors in Africa and India and hope to go back and do some more training and there's been 600 of those pastors that have planted churches and the student pastors on them have planted more churches and the same thing in India. And you know why it's happening and spreading all over the country? The secret to being a witness is finding starving people and tell them where to find food. Saints of God, we dine off the bread of life. We drink from the cup of the wine of the Holy Ghost. Find some people that need hope. Find some people that need healing. Find some people that need encouragement and tell them where to find it. Then he goes on to say, preach the word. Not any two sermons is going to be alike. Reprove. Reprove is when you're preaching and pe like when I'm training those student pastors in Africa and India that are literally risking their life to do what they're doing. When I'm there, pastor, all I'm doing is refining. All I'm doing is refining a tremendous man or woman of God already. And, and saints of God, I can only relate to it like this. When I first started preaching, I really went to a time, through a time where I struggled because I wondered if I was a preacher or a roast. Yeah, I wondered if I was a preacher or a roast. Because I'd be in a revival and God be moving in a great, magnificent way. And some older preachers walk into me and said, son, you're going to do real good. All you need is a little more seasoning. And I didn't know if I was a preacher or a roast. But now I know. I needed some refining. I knew I had some rough edges. I knew that I needed to improve my vernacular. I needed to, oh, somebody shout hallelujah. So sometimes we just reprove through preaching. 
We just help people do better than they're already doing. We refine. Other times, this is when it ain't no fun. Sometimes we got to get up and rebuke. Now, everybody wave at me. This is not political, it's spiritual. Do you know part of the reason why America's in the mess it's in right now? I wish we could blame it all on government, but we can't. The church has failed to have revival. Not this one, but the nationwide church has failed to get hungry enough for a move of God to have Holy Ghost revival because where Holy Ghost revival takes place, nothing can stop Holy Ghost revival. Man can't stop it. Government can't stop it. And if we had Holy Ghost revival, the America you're in right now, if we had Holy Ghost revival from border to border, coast to coast, in a year, you wouldn't recognize it. The church has failed, not, not you. I know I'm preaching to the choir but most churches in America are not hungry. They're not thirsty. Saints of God, I've been evangelizing for 42 years. And, and, and it is harder than ever to book revival. And when you look across the country and what's going on in America, you would think churches all over America would be saying, we need revival. I'm not whining, I'm just telling it like it is. And so sometimes you got to rebuke. Sometimes as men of God, you don't pass judgment but you say there's certain things in the word of God that are clear, black and white, and you cannot do those things and expect to inherit the kingdom of heaven. According to Galatians 5, I'm not being judgmental. Sometimes you got to rebuke. If you see someone doing something that you know is leading to disaster, they may be a Christian, but you got to be willing to lose their friendship to save their life and be willing to rebuke. And in other times, you exhort. That's when it's fun. That's when you get to go, that a boy, that a boy, way to go, brother Steve. Way to go, full gospel, that a boy, that a girl, that a boy, that a girl. Sometimes you get to exhort, but be it reproof, rebuke, or exhort, do it with all long suffering. And make sure it's doctrinal, that it lines up with the Bible. Because good will come out of it and do it with long suffering. We're all a work in progress. And sometimes you get frustrated when you preach and you come back to church the next day and they're not instantly completely transformed into what you thought they should be. Look how patient God has been with you. <laughs> Let, never mind. <laughs> if I had a mirror, I'd look. look how patient God's been with you, John. So be long suffering. We're all a work in progress. We're not always what we ought to be, but we're sure now what we used to be. And we're striving for something. We're striving for perfection in Christ Jesus. We're not satisfied. Oh, in, now why do you preach doctrine, Brother Steve? This is a word for the Lord for you. When I say that, I say that very, very carefully. A word of of the Lord for you. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. We're in that time. There's a lot of churches that will not endure sound doctrine. There's a lot of people that met Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior and have been deceived by the devil into thinking they're still all right with God, but they're living a lifestyle you can't go to heaven doing. Because why? Not because it's not in the Bible. They just won't endure sound doctrine. Now listen, go back. This is, it's hoiky joiky but I'm hurrying. Saints of God, the, 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 they will not endure sound doctrine. Saints of God, we're living in those days where people just don't want to. And the reason I want you to know, Brother Steve, this is a word from the Lord. The reason so many people have left your church over the years since you became senior pastor. Brother Owens, the reason why so many people left your church over the years wasn't because there was something wrong with your church. They could not stay here under the presence of the Holy Ghost that manifests here and the word that you preach. And they could not stay here, straddle the fence. They had to make a choice, either submit to God or because of the conviction, they would leave thinking it would go away. They left because they would not endure sound doctrine. Somebody shout hallelujah. 
but they're coming home because we're entering a day where the only thing that's going to get folks through it is sound doctrine. Now, go, go on that. Now, now we go on. But why won't they endure, endure sound doctrine? I love the Bible. You know, I, I like to watch, you know, detective shows. My wife will tell you. Um, she likes to watch Steve Harvey, you know, the teeth guy. And uh, she gets through. We actually lived, we spent the night in his crib once. He wasn't living there at the time. Another guy owned the crib. But we spent the night in the house that Steve Harvey owns. So <laughs> it's, a, it's a true story. It's, it's beyond. And what I'm trying to just tell you, but I like detective shows like Mr. Monk. I like Mr. Monk because sometimes I feel like I might have a little bit of a screw loose, you know. Um, and I, I, I like to study the Bible like I'm showing up to a crime scene, but it's a Holy Ghost move. And I like to study it like looking for all the clues that need lead to the next evidence, to the next evidence, to the next. And the next thing you know, I get this great big rhema. It's exciting. But the reason why they won't endure sound doctrine, the Bible spells it out. But after their own lust, their flesh don't like it. It disagrees with their lust. Now, lust is not just a man towards a woman or a woman towards a man. It's lust for money, lust for power, lust for stuff. Stuff's a bad one. But after their own lust, shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. So they know that what they're being taught is wrong, but it matches what they like. So they find somebody, so they find somebody that will sell out and, and just preach and tell them what they want to hear and tickle their ears. Now, woe be unto that preacher that does that because I read Ezekiel 33, Pastor, every single week of my life to remind me as a preacher of the gospel when it comes to what I say from this sacred pulpit, I will be held to an accountability that you all will not be held to. That's why I've got to preach it like I do. You go home and read Ezekiel 33 and look what happens to the men that don't. I'm not taking that. I'm not bringing that on myself. No. Now, now, now you guys are wonderful. Notice verse four. You guys are great. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth. They'll get men that will preach exactly what they want. That's why you can go to churches that will tell you that gay marriage is okay in the eyes of God. The Romans chapter one is not in the Bible. You can go to churches that will tell you. You can go to church that will tell you anything. If you just look around long enough. And if not y'all, but if that person can't find something, they can go hire somebody to tell them what they want to hear. It's called the Harlan. Now, verse number four, I'm not, I'm not picking. Guys, you can go to church and there's things that are so clearly sin in the Bible and you can go to church that, that will tell you, well, that's okay. That's okay. You're under grace. Okay, I'm under grace. I might not lose my soul, but the way of the transgressor is hard. The word transgress means to sin when you know better. And if you do that, your future is going to be hard. Wow. That good stuff. Some say that's good stuff. That's reproving stuff. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth, the word of God, and shall be turned unto fables. Now, let me run something by you. You are in spiritual warfare for the salvation of your child. Their eternity depends on you. You're in spiritual warfare for the healing of your body, for the nation of the United States of America. You're in spiritual warfare for your city, for your school, for your friends, for your family. And the devil's right in your face saying, I'm not letting go. Try this and see how, how much it'll do. Well, let me tell you, devil, Mary, Mary had a little lamb. Their fleece were white as snow. And everywhere that Mary went, the lambs were sure to go. Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses, all the king's men couldn't put Humpty Dumpty back together again. It may be. 
What I'm saying, that'll really make the devil shake in his hooves. Fables. Saints of God, when we approach the devil with spiritual fables, he laughs and he mocks us because it has no power and has no more authority. Am I being real tonight? Too real, right? And they, <laughs> and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned on the children's fables. Even a kid knows their three little pigs was a, never mind. Notice the next voice. You guys are so cool. But watch. All of us. You watch me. If you see something in my life and I'm starting to, you tell me. If you see me talk rude to somebody, tell me. Watch there. The Bible says, watch and pray. Watch thou in all things. Endure afflictions. Sometimes, Sister Debbie, all we can do is endure it. Sometimes, Pam, all we can do is endure it. You know why? Because life happens. And sometimes all you can do is endure it. And I'm going to say something right now. You see that beautiful young lady right there sitting right next to that very handsome young man, Brother Owens? You see that beautiful lady right there? You see that handsome young man sitting next to her? You see, most of us don't have the privilege of still having our parents with us. My, parent, my father died in 2000. My mother died in 1996. That's a long time ago. But when I look at that man and woman, they don't have to say it. They don't have to tell me. They're where they're at right now. Because there were times in their lives that they had to endure inflictions. They had to endure being treated badly for something they didn't do. They had to endure some things. And this church stands today and you stand today because there's men and women like that that were willing to endure some things. They were Pentecost when Pentecost wasn't cool. And, and Pastor Owens I, and Sister Owens, I owe you a debt that I could never repay because you have helped me learn how to endure some things. Because if I can endure it, God will surely get me through it. It's not if, it's just a matter of when. Endure afflictions. Oh, I'm so glad this is in the Bible. Because a lot of people say the day of revival is over. That God don't need evangelists no more. Well... Do the work of an evangelist. I'm called to be a missionary evangelist. So I'm, and then it says, make full proof of thy ministry. You don't have to prove it to anybody. If you do what God's called you to do, signs follow believers. The proof is going to follow your life. John Maxwell said in one of his books, I found it to be very fascinating. He said, you know how you know if you're a leader or not? I said, oh, that's a good thing to know as a preacher. That's a good thing to know. How do you know if you're a leader or not? And he wrote so simply, just turn around and see if anybody's following you. Because if you're a leader. <laughs> now, come on now. Notice verse six. You guys have been so good. I'm getting somewhere. For I am now ready to be offered. Son, I know I got on you a little bit. Preach the word. Don't be afraid to preach the word. Don't be afraid of sound doctrine. Don't be afraid of what's happening to me. Don't be afraid, son, because now I'm going to tell you something. For I am now ready to be offered. The devil's not taking me out. This gives new meaning to offer yourself as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto the Lord. I've been talking to the Lord and I'm ready. So now I give my life as an offering unto God. Oh, but saints of God, when this man died, he didn't die without a legacy. 2,000 years later, I'm preaching right now from his word. His life went on. Why? Because he lived a good life and he died a good death. He died a good death. He died a hero's death. He was a hero. 
for I am now ready to be offered. He didn't know that 2,000 years later, people would still be preaching his word that he wrote. For the time of my departure. Don't worry about me, son. For my ticket's been stamped. I'm ready to go. Goodbye, world. Goodbye. <coughs> Don't weep for me when I'm gone. <laughs> Never mind. I'm not going to sing. For the time of my departure is at hand. Now, this is what I want to talk to you tonight about. But I had to lay the foundation. This is a man on death row. Writing to his son. I submit to you if he could. We could. If he could live a good life, we can live a good life. And if he could die a good death, we can die a good death. You're not going to die a martyr's death, but I want to live for him to my last breath. I want to praise him to my last breath. I want to preach till there's no breath left in my body. He said, I, this is the key to his success. Son, this is all, I've told you what to do, but this is the key. I have fought a good fight. Let me tell you, the next boxer, the only good fight is the one you win. I'm not being defeated. I've offered myself unto God. And through my death, I'm going to glorify God for my time of departure is at hand. I fought a good fight. Why was this time of departure at hand? I have finished my course. I've looked it over. There's not one stone left unturned of the things that God placed in my heart to do. In fact, I've done more than I ever dreamed of doing. There's not one job he gave me that's not done. I have finished my course. Y'all listen to me. This is Brother John talking to you from my heart. When I'm done, when I, God says you're done, I want to go to heaven because I don't want to live without preaching the gospel. I don't want to live. When I'm finished, I'm ready to go. Listen to me. I fought a good fight. I finished my course. I have kept the faith. Paul lived a life. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day as a martyr, but not to me only, but unto all them also. This is for this generation that love is appearing. The martyr's crown is not just for martyrs, but it's for everybody that's looking forward to the rapture of the church. Are you looking forward to the rapture? Do you believe the Lord's coming? Are you excited about it? Are you excited about it? Are you excited about the rapture of the church? I'm excited the Lord's coming. Take this whole world, but give me Jesus. Now, please listen to me. You say, but Brother John, Brother John, now my beautiful, lovely bride went out and bought me my own pair of glasses so I don't stretch hers out. My head's a lot bigger than her head. But I'm going to, he said, Brother John, I have fought and I have fought, and I have fought. But I've got kids on drugs. I'm going through something right now. I can't even tell you, Brother John. I got lost loved ones. America's in a mess. Brother John, I'm getting tired. Fighting's hard. Fighting's hard. So let me tell you, share a story with you from a legendary heavyweight champion of the world. In fact, he's still a legend to this day because he was the lightest heavyweight champion in the history of professional boxing. His name was Gentleman Jim Colbert. <coughs> and the night that he won the world heavyweight title, he won that title in the 37th round. In those days, you would fight till your opponent was knocked out or couldn't answer the bell. Now, it's really ironic, but his opponent that night was the largest heavyweight champion in the history of boxing. His name was John L. Sullivan. 
and would still be the largest heavyweight champion in the history of boxing if you exclude Butterbean, which really wasn't a boxer. He was a cage fighter. He weighed 285 pounds. So it was, it was advertised as David versus Goliath. In those days, this is, they just transcended from bare knuckle fighting to where they wore gloves that were really like winter gloves you wear. They were so thin, but they were gloves. And, 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 and it was staged outdoors. The first 20 rounds was during daylight. It's three minute rounds. You think this was a, a testimony to, this, to, to, to John L. Sullivan and this man? You go home and find a punching bag and just hit it slowly even for three minutes. Sit down a minute, get back up and start hitting it again and do that 37 times. And nobody's punching you, mind you. <laughs> so John L. Sullivan was the undefeated champion of the world. So he's not only the largest champion that ever lived, he had some skill sets. You don't fight 37 times defending your title unless you got some skills, no matter how big you are. If someone catches you the right way, you're going down. And also, John L. Sullivan was a man that was quite confident. Confidence is important if you're a fighter. He would always walk into a bar. He was notorious for his drinking and overindulgence. And he would always walk into a bar and said, I'm John L. Sullivan, the toughest man in the world. Well, he knew, just like all of us, fellas, we know there's always someone tougher than you are. If you don't think that way till you meet him. <laughs> there's always someone going to whoop you. But he knew that there was someone tougher but he had confidence. That goes a long way, especially when you get to, to round 30, round 31. Round 30. Let me give you a modern day story to help you connect here. How many remember Michael Spinks? How many remember Mike Tyson? And uh, someone asked me when Mike Tyson was knocking everybody out. They said, John, you being an ex-boxer, what do you think about Mike Tyson? I said, well, I'm going to have to watch him a while. Because right now he strikes me as somebody that's got a million dollar body and a 10 cent brain. I'm not putting the man down. He's done a lot of changing since then, but he had no self-discipline. He had no self-control. And because of that, I, I, I knew what was going to happen. He was going to destroy himself, which is what he did. But remember the fight when he fought Michael Spinks to win the title back? And he met in the center ring. I remember that fight. And he leaned over. He didn't bite his ear off. That was Holyfield. He leaned over and whispered something in Michael Spink's ears. And how many remember the fight? Michael Spinks went like that. Well, Brother Owens, he used some adjectives that I cannot use, nor would I because I'm in church and I don't talk like that anyway. But he used some adjectives to tell Mr. Spinks what he was going to do to him. Basically wiped the floors with him, including the bathrooms, and he used all kinds of vulgarity with it. And said, when I'm done with you, your, 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 your mother won't even know you. Do you know what Michael Spinks said back to Mike Tyson? I know it. I know it. And how many remember the phantom punch? One round into the fight, one minute into the fight, you watch it in slow motion. If that glove even touched him, it disgraced him. And down he went. Why should I not take a dive? Because if I fight, he's going to whoop me anyway because I already know he's going to whoop me. So your mindset going into the fight has a lot to do be about being victorious. That's why I'm preaching this tonight. You can't lose with Jesus Christ. Jesus is with you. You can't lose. Now, I'm going to close right here. So in the 37th round, Jim, gentleman Jim Colbert knocks out John L. Sullivan in the 37th round. He started the fight at 156 pounds, fought in the sun for 20 rounds. So he, I know as an ex-boxer, I would lose 10 to 12 pounds of fight. So he's down in the mid 140s and he clocks the dude and knocks him out. So a woman reporter asked him for an interview after the fight. And he granted her an interview 
when he wouldn't talk to anyone else because he didn't want to belittle John L. Sullivan. He didn't want to rub his face into it. And she asked him, David, how did you defeat Goliath? Jim, how did you defeat John L. Sullivan, the biggest heavyweight in the history of the planet Earth? And these are the words of a champion that might help you. He said, are you listening? When your feet are so tired that you have to shuffle back to the center of the ring, fight one more round. When your arms are so tired that you can hardly lift your hands to come on guard, fight one more round. When your nose is bleeding and your eyes are black and you're so tired, you wish your opponent would crack you one on the jaw and put you to sleep, fight one more round. The man that will fight one more round will never, ever be whipped. Fight one more round. Fight one more round. Fight one more round. The Christian, the man or woman Christian that will fight one more round will never, ever, ever be with. Fight one more round. Brother John, I'm sick. Perhaps you're dying. Fight one more round. Brother John, my child's so far from God, I don't know what to do. Fight one more round. Brother John, I'm weary and I'm tired. Fight one more round. Brother John, my loved ones are on drugs. Fight one more round. Brother John, I'm afraid. Fight one more round. Brother John, I'm hurting. Fight one more round. Brother John, I'm in a battle of my lifetime. Fight one round more round. Brother John, my church won't grow. Fight one more round. Brother John, my ministry isn't taking off. Fight one more round. Brother John, I'm afraid. I'm depressed. I'm scared. Fight one more round. The Christian that will fight one more round will never, ever be whipped. Fight one more round. So, throw your hands in the air in victory. Throw your hands in the air and praise God for the victory. And no matter what you've been facing, no matter what you've been going through, throw your hands up in victory and say, I'm going to fight one more round. And if I don't get my miracle today, I'm going to fight one more round tomorrow. And if I don't get it tomorrow, I'm going to fight one more round the next day. I'm going to, I'm going to fight one more round. Just one more round. Just one more round. Just one more round. Raise your hands. The man or the woman that will fight one more round will never be whooped. Throw your hands in the air. And I want you to give me the privilege of being your servant. I have not come to be served, but to serve. And I'm gonna lay hands on you and we're gonna join up together with Jesus and we're gonna fight one more round. Throw your hands in the air. And I want you, you've, you've seen boxers in the ring celebrate jumping around. You don't have to do that. Get up on the ropes with their hands raised. You don't have to do that. But I want you to run to this altar tonight with your hands raised in such a way that you know you're victorious. You know you're about to knock out Goliath. You know the biggest problem you've ever faced is about to be laid down on its back and be counted out for the last time. Are you ready to fight one more round? Are you ready to go one more round? Now just stand to your feet. And I'm gonna ask you, please, and those of you that can't stand a long time, sit down in these chairs up front and I wanna lay hands on each one of you because this is me doing what God taught me how to do. He taught me how to be a fighter before he taught me how to be a preacher. Woman, I know it's not easy. I know it's hard when your body is sick, when you're fighting what people would call a handicap. I don't call it a handicap. But woman of God, I'm sure you tonight fight one more round. The woman that'll fight one more round 
will never be defeated. God won't let you be defeated. Just don't quit. Just don't quit. The Christian that'll fight one more round will never be whooped. Saints of God, I don't know how much you know about impartation, but tonight God's going to give you supernatural victory, but he's going to impart in you the fighting spirit that the apostle Paul had. I've accomplished all these things because I fought a good fight. We got to learn to fight Christians. Man of God, I am humbled and honored to call you my friend and my family. Man of God, as the least of God's servants, but I am a servant of the most high God. I declare to you tonight, just fight one more round. Just one more round. Just one more round. The man that will fight one more round will never be whooped. Woman of God, when discouragement comes, when you get tired, remember this old preacher tonight and remember the woman that will fight one more round will never be whooped. The man that will fight one more round This heavyweight champion who defied all odds, Brother Owens, the lightest heavyweight champion defeating the heaviest heavyweight champion. And you know, he gave us the secret. I did it by fighting one more round. What if he'd have quit in round 36? Could anybody have held it against him? What if he'd have quit in round 30, Brother Steve? Could anybody hold that against him? An hour and a half of boxing? Think about that. Woman of God, you have fought a good fight. You have kept the faith. In the name of Jesus. Come here, girl. You're my sister, so I can call you that. Throw your hands up. I don't know what you're facing. Fight one more round. Fight one more. Woman, the woman that can fight one more round will never be whooped. Don't look at it as a lifetime battle. Look at it as one round at a time and God will give you strength for that round. He'll give you one more round. Just one more round. I want to ask some people here, how many had your mind made up when this revival started Sunday? If you make it possible, God, I won't miss a service. You had a mindset. I don't know what round it'll be. Round one, round two, round three, round four. But I know if I keep on fighting, the woman who'll fight one more round will never be whooped. I've learned that from you, Sister Owens. Be healed in the name of Jesus. See, Christians don't realize that we got to learn to fight. We've got, it's a faith walk. We're, it's a faith life. We're saved by faith, but it's also a faith. We got to learn to fight the fight of faith. One more round. Hey, sis, you think you can go one more round? You think you can go one more round? Do you think you can keep your feet under you for one more round? Shut the ha There he is. Holy Ghost. Shut the rat. Let the Holy Ghost from heaven fall on you. Are you ready? Are you ready? Jack his jaw, sister. Jack his jaw. Knock him off his hooves. Hit him so hard, his horns come off his head. Fight one more round. Just fight one more round. Woman of God, you've got what it takes. You're a fire. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, I know that language. I know that language. You are so close to your miracle. Be not weary and well-doing for in due season shall reap if you faint not. Fight one more round. 
Nobody leave this altar. As Christians, we are trained to be pacifists. By nature, Christians are pacifists. We turn our cheek as we should with our fellow man. But when it comes to the devil, we're not one time told to turn our cheek to the devil. Fight. Fight for your family. Fight for your country. Fight for your pastor. Fight for your church. Fight for your marriage. Fight for your healing. Man of God, the man that'll fight one more round. I know that language. I know that language. Oh, someone raise your hands victoriously in this room. God is with me. Jesus is with me. We're one spirit. One more round. Sister, if you can fight one more round, you'll never be whooped. Paul said, I have fought a good fight. I've kept the faith. I'm ready to be offered unto God to go to heaven. But son, I'm gonna tell you how to make it. Fight one more round. Fight one more round. Fight one more round. Fight one more round. I'm getting drunk. I'm getting drunk in the Holy Ghost. There he is. Keep coming. Mighty woman of God. Come here, young lady. Come here. Your faith is not in vain. Fight. There he is. Man of God, be healed in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Fight one more round. Fight one more round. Fight one more round. See, if we're not careful, if we're not careful, it would have been so easy for Gentleman Jim to, to say, I throw in the towel round 34. Who would have questioned it? No one. What if he had quit round 35? Round 36? He had every reason to. The man that'll fight one more round, the woman that'll fight one more round will never be whipped. I know you're fixing to sing. Well, go get that baby of yours and bring her to me right now. She's going to get healed tonight. God's going to impart healing into her body. Woman, fight one more round. There he is. Fight one more round. Hey, I'm not backing up. I'm not giving an inch. My heels are dug in. My feet are dug. Fight one more round. Fight one more round. Let me tell you something, baby. Uncle John would never hurt you. I'm a daddy and I'm a grandpa and a great grandpa before I'm a preacher. I wouldn't want anybody to harm my child, nor would I harm you. But God doesn't want you to have any sickness in your body. You're a child of God. And I've come to serve you. Blessed are little children. Forbid them not to come unto me. For such is the kingdom of God. Woman of God. Fight one more round. In the name of Jesus. Lord, please stretch forth your mighty hand to heal. That signs and wonders will be done. In the name of the holy child Jesus. Let great grace and great power be upon her. Be healed. In, young lady, just put your hands in the air. Be healed in the name of Jesus. Be healed in the name of Jesus. Be healed in the name of Jesus. Be, what you've made happen for others, now I'm going to make happen for you. People have been healed as you sang. Now I'm going to heal for you because you've asked me to. Because you've made it happen for others, I'm going to make it happen for you. Fight one more round. Keep coming. Just one more round. Just one more round. Holy Ghost. The woman that'll fight one more round will never be whooped. You do not fight alone for your spirit and my spirit are one, saith Jesus. You are more than a conqueror, saith Jesus. The battle is not yours, but the battle is mine, saith Jesus. 
Just fight one more round. Just fight one more round. See, see, just no, if you haven't been prayed for yet, just come forward, don't leave because the Holy Ghost is still all over me. Physically, I'm tired, but spiritually, I'm getting stronger by the minute. And don't go by me being tired. That does not hinder the...